I think this whole idea of, um, of the emergence of the concept of resiliency for, for our students is particularly for community college students, which in my case, and in the case of a lot of my colleagues, um, are, 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 are first generation college goers, immigrants, first in their family to go to college. Um, it, is, it is an important one because there really isn't a lot in their background that supports their, their, their being, able to, being able to spend time trying things, right? To, to, to try, and, try and fail, try and fail, but at last try and succeed. And the whole idea of, of having a, a student who's resilient and having a pedagogy that, that really is mindful about fostering that resiliency is something that is particularly important for, for community colleges. And this is really the first time that I've seen sort of a collective impact kind of conversation happening. And I think it's really a, a, a new watershed for, for community college teaching and learning. Welcome to another roundtable from the Northeast Resiliency Consortium. My name is Ed Fiennes. I am the content specialist here for the lead team. And the voice you just heard was of Bunker Hill Community College President Pam Edinger. She is definitely a go-to voice, I think, for our little project here. Um, it's We wanted her to speak first and speak last and speak a whole bunch in the middle because uh, for lack of, a, of being eloquent here on a Thursday night, she gets it. Uh, she gets what we're doing, and she has been one of our favorite champions to turn to. Uh, and we decided we would be negligent if we didn't before this grant closes to not put a microphone, uh, or in this case, a telephone, <laughs> get around the other end of a telephone and get some of her thoughts about uh, what she's doing and how what she's doing, all the great things that she has going on at Bunker Hill, um, is part of what we do and how we're a part of what they do. And you know, simpatico. Uh, the other voice you will hear on this evening's uh, recording will be that of Alexandra Scheinert. She is the communication specialist. Uh, she popped up a little uh, a little while back on our introductory podcast. So if you are not familiar with what we do here at the NRC, please go ahead and check that out. It is uh, you're here on our SoundCloud page. And or if you haven't found us on our SoundCloud page, there's another link to it here on Ning. So uh, without further ado, let's get back to Pam, uh, our conversation between me, Alex and Pam on resiliency and what she and uh, what Pam is doing uh, in the, up in the Charleston Mass and Oakville Community College. What would you say makes a resilient college president before we get into how resiliency kind of trickles down? Um, what would you say a resilient college president it does? I, I, I think it has, it has a lot to do with, um, well, two different things. One is calling attention to the concept that resiliency is really a way of doing business, right, at the college. Um, we don't move forward as a college unless we innovate. And you can't really innovate um, without being resilient because we know that we can, you know, throw a hundred packages of spaghetti against the wall and only four will stick. Mm -hmm. um, but without that process of freeing folks from having to apologize for their failure, but rather, you know, really celebrating failure as a process or of of trying as a process, um, you don't get any innovation. So I, I think part of resiliency of being a college president is is to foster a culture of forgiveness in in, in a way in very traditional language, mm -hmm. in that it's okay if this doesn't work, try something else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and it, and it's that you know and it's that 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 ability to to really accept the 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 the, the pure scientific concept of 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 try and true, you know, of trial and error or trial and error until you succeed. Um, so y y you see it a lot of things and if it doesn't work, it's okay. And being able to say it's okay 
um, it's a large part of what teaching is all about. And it's no different for a college president as it is for a faculty member um, in relationship to a student, right? If it doesn't work, try again. There's more than one answer. There's more, more than you know, two ways to, to go at a problem. Um, so I, yeah. that, that's really a part of it. Yeah, I think it's funny. Um, the, I mean, uh, coming from a faculty side, there, I'm also a faculty member at one of the one of the consortium colleges, and the one theme that tends to come up, and, and this is just sort of credit side back and forth, that uh, faculty and staff can sometimes have, or faculty even in administration can have a complete lack of what you just <laughs> described for one another, and that's <laughs> like. It's it's a very sort of like well obviously you know it's like we all need to kind of hang out in the in the lab school the nursery school that they run <laughs> you know it's like yeah <laughs> forgive one another if somebody screws up if they miss a meeting or they you know misrepresent you or something at a community meeting or something let it go like yeah but yeah that culture of forgiveness must be I mean that's must be such a relief to to be fostering I mean has is there any is there any brushback against that kind of thing are there do you get any stiff upper lips with that kind of you know that that kind of way of way of well, problems. So I think it's in the it's in the life of an institution, right? An institution, let's say a college, goes through um, various phases, just like human being growth, right? There, there's mm -hmm. times in your institution where you need to be very very um, strict and 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 very authoritarian, even um, mm -hmm. because there are problems you have to fix. You know, you've got a college out of control and and you have to trim back, you have to reorganize, realign, and all of that. It's really hard for, for a culture of innovation to happen during chaos. I mean, folks believe that chaos is tied to innovation. I don't think so. I think innovation is tied to stability and reassurance, right? So there, there's going to be a time in the life of an institution that you need to have very strong control um, because you have to fix problems, and they're very concrete problems. Once your college is stabilized and you have a stable um, support system and a stable administration, then the whole idea of, of, of being able to experiment and having the latitude to experiment and not be, not be punished for it um, has got to become then part of, part of the culture of the college. And it change, this changes over time. It changes over time from... It can change from a, 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 a very strict and, and authoritarian disciplinarian college into one that's much freer, depending on where the life of the institution is. If your IT system is completely wacky and you can't get anything to work, you can't innovate. Thinking about institutional barriers, thinking about all of the attitudes that make each of our institutions across the consortium unique, I'm really interested in how you've personally help to foster that kind of culture where innovation is important and resiliency is important. And so is that something that is a personal, it, you know, has to do with your personal path and your personal narrative, or do you feel like it ha also has to do with the region that you're in and the community that you're serving? It's always a convergence of different things, right? I, I, I was very fortunate when I came to this college that it had, um, before I came two and a half years ago, the college had a very, very stable um, administration for a long time. I mean, the, pres the last president, Mary Fifield, um, and, and she and I are still in touch, she had been here for 13, 14 years. So she had a long period of time to stabilize the college. So the budget was stable, the infrastructure was relatively stable. I mean, there's some things that are wacky, but every college does. But by and large, the college had a very, very functional um, place where there, there were, inno, you know, innovations in pockets. When I came, I was able to take that stability and overlay some of the things that I've learned over the last four or five years um, in California from a very good college president, actually two college presidents, who who is able to say, no, it's okay, but it doesn't work, try again. So it's the way I grew up professionally, plus the fact that I landed in a place that does not have a whole lot of turmoil. So it was a convergence of really good things. And the third aspect of it is something that I've learned in California um, out of necessity, which is there, there needs to be an, an incredible amount of respect and freedom for faculty teaching in the classroom. Faculty are your content experts. They're your guides. And faculty primacy um, and trust 
is is going to be the ultimate I don't know prize for me in my eyes because they were leading the students so I was able to have a wonderful faculty have a very stable institution and a personal philosophy about about having flexibility and, and respecting faculty work all of that really came together for me to be able to say here's some money here's some resources go and try it it's okay if it doesn't work then come back and try again I mean, I'm, I, maybe I'm just naive from where I've been living, right? <laughs> that I have never, <laughs> I have never worked with a faculty who, who, who is, didn't have student at heart. Um, you know, there's always the 0.1 percent of anywhere of of any personnel that's going to be problematic. In my experience, it's even smaller than that. Every fa faculty I've worked with, I'm able to get something positive out of it, and they all love our students. I don't care if they're traditional or innovative. So counting on the fact that everyone believes in student potential, that's the common point. Mm -hmm. um, sure. And, and, you know, like I said, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a Pollyanna in so many ways, but I can be a Pollyanna because I've got so many good faculty surrounding me. It's, it sounds like there's a, there's a, a you, you serve as sort of a unifier of sort of, again, if faculty already have that kind of engagement with their students in almost sort of, and in, in that same sort of like Pollyanna kind of way, it's like, I don't, I mean, if the money's not there, fine. I'll, you know, if, if I'm using popsicle sticks as opposed to, you know, class <laughs> or whatever, fine, I don't care. I'll, I'll, I'll make, I'll make it work. And that's kind of a community college thing. I think we all kind of have our, you know, our badges and our scars and our sort of like, hey man, I've been hustling for right. a while kind of thing. <laughs> um, but I mean, I, I wanted I wanted to ask about sort of well, where does a grant fit into what you're describing? It sounds like you have a you have a great sort of contact and sort of like a, sort of the vision person, and that you know you have faculty below sort of not below you but sort of around you filling out that mission. Where does a grant step in? I mean, is are grants used to sort of change colleges? Would you say, or is it kind of like this? I mean, I, I, I likened it to, to sort of like this off-site lab where you build tools and colleges can kind of come along and, and pick one up and take it with them back to their cabin and work with it or something. I had, a, I had a college president who really gave me my start. He used to call grants the margin of excellence. You know, he says, yeah, here, here's a little bit of money. Go, go, and, go and play. Go and play in a way that's risk-free. Mm -hmm. um, but I found over the years, that's true, I mean, you know, unless you get something like a Perkins, which is, you know, kind of multi-year and you get to do a lot more things. Um, mm -hmm. In one way, it's a push start, you know, it's, a, it's, it's that jump start. But I think it's more important than that. It is really a proof of concept in my mind so that you can take it and, and provide a framework that sometimes um, what I call a scattering of innovation doesn't give you, right? So we've been having, let's take resiliency. We, we've been having conversations about how to make students more, how, 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 do they, how do we get students to translate the grit that, they li that, they, that they've been living with in their, in their immigrant and first generation student lives and translate mm -hmm. it into, into a place of strength for them to work from? How do we teach them to say, it's okay, try multiple times, try different ways, try, 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 and all of those things are positive. How do we take that um, and, and, and make it more ubiquitous? And I think what Grand does sometimes is that it provides you with a vocabulary framework. Mm -hmm. So you can name things, right? The naming, naming is powerful. <laughs> naming uh, yeah. is powerful, once, right? Once you've named right. it, then it has a place in the lexicon. Then you have a lexicon. Then you have a theory of change. I think what Grand does is exactly that. Grants across the country normalizes vocabulary. It normalizes concepts, and it makes like concepts the same. And, and sometimes for, you know, with, with colleges like mine where innovations happening in various pockets, sometimes I don't even know about them, having a grant to pull folks together and say, let's call it that. Like we, right now we have a Title III grant to work on a system of advising called LifeMap, right? So LifeMap, let's say, has six pillars. It, let's see if I can name them. Um, <laughs> it's educational, educational planning, financial planning, um, career planning, social networks. Um, academic support, and an e-portfolio to house all of that work in, right? So you do it across the lifespan of your student. Everybody on this campus, whether they be faculty or advisors or whatever, know those domains in their own work. They all do it, whether we name it or not. But by getting a grant and calling this life mapping, and I stole it from Valencia Community College, by the way. Um, 
<laughs> because we're able to name these domain, everybody can sort of hook their innovations into this vocabulary and lexicon and share it. And therefore, you can share best practices with a common, um, a common collector almost, right? So, so mm -hmm. you know what this grant? I mean, so grants gives you that jump start to be able to do that work, but it, it provides it provides the theory, it provides the theoretical basis by which you can operationalize things. Um, and grants are, are the beginning of, of testing if something can be scaled up. So yeah, I think it really does have a place. Um, we did, when we got the, the, the Achieving the Dream Catalyst grant, our project was to make sure that all, all full-time students have a freshman seminar course, and we call it um, Learning Community Seminar, where we combine the traditional first year experience kind of work, you know, time management, learn how to be a college student, um, with um, a piece of discipline content, rather it be business or health or whatever it is, that is, um, that is interesting uh, and, and, and exploratory. We put those two pieces together. So we have courses like the cultural assets along the orange line, you know, in our, 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 our trans, transit system, or um, uh, men of color in the greater Boston area, um, or, um, you know, the foods of the nations, whatever that, that would sort of flavor that freshman seminar. We're supposed to deliver this to all full-time students, first-time students. We use the grant for that. But the second part of growing out from that is the scaling up because we knew it worked. The grant gave us proof of concept. So now we're touching 7,000 students a year, part-time and full-time. I would never be able to do that kind of experiment without the grant. It sounds to me like the grant is a huge vehicle to move forward on things that you know kind of already exist and are happening across the institution, and this really helps to propel it forward. And we're seeing this at Bunker Hill with the resiliency competency model. When you said, you know, it helps to have the vocabulary as a framework, the first thing that kind of came to mind to me was like, that's what our resiliency competency model is. It's all, you know, key things that... Ed and I and our colleagues here, we've talked about how at any higher ed institution, you have critical thinking, you have adaptability, you have self-awareness, reflective learning, and collaboration. It's not unique. These are elements. These are pillars of higher ed. And so having this competency model, we see it too as, you know, helping to scale the work. And I'm sure you know that the resiliency competencies are doing the same thing that the grant that you just spoke uh, about are doing, which yep. is they're touching students, you know, through their coursework. And there's a lot of power behind that, but it's also this collaboration that I think you're you're alluding to that's happening at the institutional level. And so we're real. Ed is really involved in the resiliency mapping that's happening at your school. And, you know, I think that this is a really great space to talk about maybe why some of the resiliency competencies are having such great reception at Bunker Hill. We would love to kind of hear your take. I know you had a great visit with Smart Sparrow um, a few weeks ago, and there's a lot of excitement. And I think it really highlights that theme of innovation that you've helped to really illustrate happening at your school. Right. I mean, teaching and learning is lonely work, right? Um, you're in with a group of students and, and, and a lot of the work, a lot of the pedagogical advancements happens in your head, right? Yeah, we do a lot of yeah. professional development, but when you look at any community college, professional development day is like three days out of the year, mm -hmm. right? Unless you're conscious about having, having you know, teaching circles or, 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 or communities of practice. And that may be a way to do this, this resiliency dissemination piece. Um, unless you're doing that and talking about what happens on the ground with these things, it, it's, it's lonely. You can, you can be as smart as you want and as, as charismatic as you want. You're touching 20 students, mm -hmm. not 14,000. So grants are really system building mechanisms in my mind. Um, the best grants are the ones that build systems, mm -hmm. not the built venue for conversations. And it, it, it's, it's, it's unique. It really is unique in the way that it operates in the United States. Yeah, it's funny that I, I would have said it was the 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 ground that I know from you know Brian and Liz and Mike you know and Jamie. I, I didn't get a chance to meet Jamie, but you know like just those four folks alone, because they already kind of were a gang, 
and we gave them, like you said, the system, the sort of like, here's some language, here's some words, you know, yeah. like you, you, the, the, and, and they were like, well, yeah, and I'll do this and you'll do that. And hey, Liz, do that. Like they sort of, I, I imagine them like <laughs> le leaning back at like at the old globe, like the old Boston Globe, like, you know, editorial yeah. floor or whatever, like people leaning back in their chairs, yelling at each other, like that kind of, that kind of environment that, that has been nurtured at Bunker Hill for quite a while, like that was such a fertile ground for us to drop these sort of like these, these five little ideas. And they're like, well, yeah. And they just kind of went and ran with it. And I think what they made was, was frankly, it's, it's really, I mean, they've really kind of become superstars, I think of this, of this, of this project oh, yeah. because of that. Absolutely. And I'll tell you, and, 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 you know, this is, this is something that I don't talk, that I don't talk about often when people ask about, you know, what is the place of leadership in some of this stuff? As much as I really do believe that leadership needs to let folks do the work, you know, let the experts do their work, part of what makes it so much fun for me is that for a minute there, I can take off my president's hat, walk into a room when this stuff is happening, and jump right in. Mm -hmm. And, 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 <laughs> <Yep>. and, you know, <laughs> and, yeah, and, 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 yeah. right? And be a teacher and a scholar for 45 minutes before I have to put my jacket again and go back out and do something else. But I think that's really important for the campus to know that your leadership can have those conversations with you. And mm -hmm. it is not just someone to hand out budget or someone to hand out, you know, an org chart that that sometime in the past before I got really old, um, I really did teach and learn. You know? <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's something like someone who's uh, like you said, you, you, you've, you've been there, you've done it, you, you've earned your stripes, you've been in the, been in the room. Like what, what is something like Smart Sparrow? Uh, how does, how did, I mean, was your initial response kind of a big yes? Did it take some convincing? You know, the, there's always going to be sort of, you know, people that are going to kind of grumble and sort of say, well, it's a new gizmo. And then there's other people that are going to think it's, you know, uh, it's, it, it can be an incredibly, awesome tool on the edge of something that's going to be even bigger and better, hopefully down the line. What, what was your, how, how have you, again, as, as both an educator and now uh, a president of educators in a way that like, what is something like Smart Sparrow? How did, how did you, how, how was your engagement been over the past, you know, let's say a few months or a year or so? Okay. I, I can tell you that I was, I actually had a demo of Smart, Smart Sparrow in, um, in another environment other than Bunker Hill. I was not able to be here that day, but I was excited that they were here because I would known how it worked. Mm -hmm. um, so so I, can, I can tell you from, from that context, um, I think there will be a lot more versions of the Smart Sparrow kind of, um, kind of um, algorithm going on, uh, algorithm work going on. There will be yeah, other I've versions of the brands. You know, this is the, remember the beginning where there was only Blackboard? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, Blackboard was no, a miserable, I, I, horrible, annoying, aggravating thing to make me nuts. I have no personal feelings about it, obviously. None at all. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> obviously. I remember. I remember. <laughs> yeah, um, and, and, you know, I, and, and I had, I remember when it first, I'm old, I, I know I keep saying this, but I, I've seen the evolutions of that. Now I'm seeing the evolutions of Smart Sparrow, and I'm seeing the evolutions of things like, you know, CBE for competency-based learning and all of that. Mm -hmm. I think the important piece about Smart Sparrow, and this is counterintuitive, it's not even necessarily the tool itself. It is really the mindset that allows the faculty member to say, wow, here's a tool that does other things that matches the way that I want to treat students. Right. right? Because you can, you can have, an, have as many smart, you can have a whole slew, a flock of smart sparrows in the room across the college and have absolutely no impact on students if you don't have the faculty conversation with students, which is where it makes a difference. The interface, in my mind, the effective interface is not the smart, smart, smart sparrow student interface. It's really the faculty student interface that allows them to say, here, here's the tool. Right? The growth mindset has to be with the faculty, and the faculty has to get that to the students before smart sparrow can be, can be effective. So I, I'm old-fashioned in that way. I think, I think the faculty's interaction with the students and how they get the students to approach the tool it's just as important as the tool itself. I was at Learn Launch two, two, three, four weeks ago. I can't remember now. My days are blending together. And, you know, you have all these really smart IT people in the room who's into educational technology, right? So that's the heart of Learn Launch. 
And folks are, and I sat in this one session where folks talked and talked and talked about software and delivery mode, and they would never talked about the audience or the student. <laughs> I'm like, well, yeah. I need to tell you, you're selling it to students. And, and that's always my fear, like with Blackboard or Moodle or any one of those pieces. And the beginning when it came out, it, you know, MOOCs was going to be the solution to the world. Yeah. The solution to the yeah. world to me is not, it's not MOOCs. The solution to me is a better conversation about what should we do while we're face to face? You know, what, what, what is value added face to face so that I can off, offload all of those things that you can do by yourself? Um, so we can keep that value of our interchange. Um, and I think Smart, Smart Sparrow is kind of like that, that it is the faculty saying to the students, you know, you can really do it. This, this is normal. You try and try again. This is part of the process that you ought to be learning. Now go to Smart Sparrow and then be mindful that this is the way that it's working. You're talking sort of Carol Dweck, the sort of growth mindset grit stuff. Like one of the, 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 the natural, you know, one of her claims is that her sort of natural, what will naturally come from this kind of grittiness is a community has to form. Because if you have several gritty people in the room, you know, sort of, I mean, I don't know, covalent bonds are going to start forming between the molecules, so to speak. That like our community college is now that much more on that front edge of, supplying, you know, where content knowledge is king now, K through 12. Like, you got to be hitting those benchmarks. You got to be hitting, you got to be going through gate one and got to hit gate two after a couple years and gate three after a year and a half, that kind of thing. That, like, it's, if, if all that stuff is being so programmed or programmed in, in such a way at K through 12, our community college is that much more either capable or responsible for taking care of the resiliency training that were the the soft skills stuff that's uh, even or even again those I'm thinking like those are students coming out of you know coming out of I don't know Revere or Lynn Public Schools or something that you know you also mentioned a couple times first generation and sort of immigrant students that you know like that that kind of in a way that kind of life training has already happened to them but they wouldn't think to think about it maybe in in the case of an education like why are community colleges outfitted for this if they even if they are so this is kind of like postmodern art right it's become self referential <laughs> once you get to the community college it, well but in some ways it's true right so your k12 you have you have students who are still young they're in the, the oldest of them are just in their teens they have not yet experienced what else is out there in some ways okay so so they go through the motions they don't learn anything let's say the worst of them don't learn anything they come out Okay, so they think they can own the world. After about three or four or five years of working at McDonald's, your self-reflection changes, right? Your view of the world changes. And I think that idea of I've got to now go back to community college and make something of a career, make something of my next stage in life, that actual self-awareness is, is an additional layer onto what we would call grit that you would have developed in your younger years. So it's not just a greedy person coming out of K-12. You have now a greedy person coming out of K-12 needing, wanting the skills, but also having some inkling of self-reflection that this is important. And you know that that idea of self-reflection and knowing that it's important is like almost 50% of the game, right? Because they want it. And yeah. I think for that reason, for, for that sense of self-awareness in the community college world, like three quarters of my students are non-traditional in age. Right. So, so, so that kind of drive gives the whole idea of resiliency competency in that space much more, um, much more power, much more um, a greater impetus because it's self-directed a lot of it. I think what has changed is the external business perception, industry's perception of community colleges um, as being the fertile ground for, for the workforce. Um, for good or ill, um, that is the truth. Now, a lot of the business industry look into community colleges that change, the, that change our reputation or our perception only has to do with the fact that they're getting the workers they want. But what has really changed because they're focusing on us and we're getting more resources to do that work is our ability to now build in what I call the restoration of privilege, right? So our students are definitely not students of means, most of them are not, 
and mm -hmm. they they have never had this attention paid to them. I mean, in in any way that you can think of, right? Yeah. Because they are the ones who didn't do particularly well in K twelve. They can't get into the four year college. They're now working, and they're working class. Some of them are poor. They have never had college as the center of their lives, and it still isn't. So we're spending a lot of time giving them advising, student development, all the things that you and I are thinking about, you know, the resiliency pieces, the, the sort of social emotional growth piece. And what we're doing is that we're becoming their parents and their dinner table and their village, right? We're restoring the privilege that they should have had when they were growing up, the focus that should have had. Um, I, I, I will never forget this example. I was at um, I went to college at um, at Barnard, and and I took a you know I, I, I was on a on a pre med track for a little bit, and I took biology and all those crazy difficult science courses. I would struggle to try to get through my midterms, and I didn't have a tutor. My roommate would call her dad, and he would fly up from like I don't know from from somewhere down south to help her prepare for her midterms. He would fly on an airplane. This was 25 years ago where plane tickets were still really expensive. And I looked at her and I said, oh, my God, here's the other, here's the other half of the world, right? right? The other half of the world with means. Um, it, it is, we had Byron Pitts here this afternoon, and he was talking about growing up poor. And he says, well, you know, in my eyes, he says, there are two types of folks that I meet. There are the people of means, the, the people of privilege, and good for them. I'm glad they grew up comfortable and they have the ability to excel without having to struggle. But then there are the children of the storm. Right? And hmm. he says, and most of you in the audience are the children of the storm. You struggle. And, and, and in my mind, I was thinking, yeah, and we're here as a college to restore that privilege. Um, and, and to tell you the truth, all the grit, the resilience, and everything else, it, to call attention to it and say that this is a strength as part of restoring that privilege, that they have the right to it. Yeah, and I think something it reminds you, what you're saying reminds me of something like uh, sort of a PLA or you know prior learning assessment, that kind of thing, where so mm -hmm. much of I mean uh, there's a vast back of the house kind of thing that I feel like I don't understand, and there are people on our lead team that absolutely do. But for me, what PLA <laughs> is about is is exactly what you're describing that sort of like, we're gonna look you, I'm gonna look across this table at you, you know, I'm, your, I'm an advisor, you're a, you're a student, I'm gonna look you in the eye and say, your life experience is an education that you already have. And I am, essence, I, as sort of the representative Bunker Hill Community College, I'm saying, come on in. That is an education, and you're gonna get three credits for it. <laughs> you know, like, the, like that's that kind, of, that kind of experience of a student, if they can have it, you know, with something like PLA, that is that to me is what what the, what this sort of community college as an idea is all about. I mean, I've always referred to community college as democracy college, right? We are the last bastion of democracy in education because yeah. everyone comes who wants to learn. But the, the the important piece of that too is that within that democracy right now, most of our students are immigrants in their own system. Um, they have yeah. the same type of, I mean, my parents were immigrants and I was an immigrant. I came when I was 11. I spoke no English and, and I didn't, I didn't come from a place of poverty either. So you can see some of our students are even compounded beyond that in terms of their struggle. I mean, there is, there, there, is, there, there are, until very recently, there are so few roadmaps for immigrants to really learn the country, um, of, of education here in America. You, you, mm -hmm. you. You struggle on your own. I mean, I filled out my own financial aid form. I did my own. I did my own um, application, and this was quite a few years ago. But there was no transfer advisor. There was, you know, there wasn't any of this, the stuff that's supporting the students now. So either I go and grab that privilege however I can, or else I, you know, would still be working, making widgets somewhere. So you know, I was the accidental. I was the accidental tourist, you know, in this land of democracy, and I don't want anybody else ever. To, to be the asset in old Taurus. So who else is going to do it if not community college? No one. Yeah. None that I can yeah. think of. No, absolutely not. And that, that again, that's, a, it's, I think that's the, the, 
and when you have open, the second you say open access, mm -hmm. the second you say you sort of ascribe above your building that like yes, you know, whatever, whatever, however that yes, whatever form that yes takes. And you're yeah. really trying to make something, you know, like like that's when so much of what happens around, you know, either if it's a language barrier, if it's simply just the idea that like I, you know, I owned a business or, you know, I was a professional of some kind, you know, where I in Karachi and, and wherever I'm coming and, you know, suited whereas wherever I'm coming from, like, like that, you know. I'm going to walk into another building. It's you know the people in it are going to say yes to me, and they're and I'm going to be part of something. That that sort of part of something thing I think is at the bottom again at the bottom of what Carol Dweck was talking about, and I think it's ultimately at the bottom of of you know what we are doing with our five competencies and everything that we're trying to make is that you know people who may or may not be feel like they don't belong to the point where they may be they may be homeless they may be living rough out of their cars but they're coming into our building they're getting warm they're and they're and they're sitting and they're learning something and they're participating in classes that are based on the idea that service workers are not only part of a community they are the thing that makes a community and you can be one of those people that that that's i mean it's i, I mean that's I, it's really nice to kind of yeah, it's I it's powerful. It's it's what it's. I mean, it's the reason why I kind of sweat blood for this job. You know, like and it sounds like you do too. Like like that's really that's really what it, it's almost like. Well, yeah, duh, I'm gonna, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Um, but, just to kind of to kind of wrap. There's a, there's a part of me that that acknowledges all of that, and and you know I, I I buy into all of it. The idea that that resiliency can be born of all kinds of different experiences. There's also the scholar in me, though, that's very clear about the fact that if we're going to do PLA, uh, we're going to do, you know, we're going to do all kinds of education on, on uh, sort of meta -educa education on how to be resilient and all of that. We also have to be extremely mindful that the content knowledge of these fields um, be as rigorous as they as they have always been, right? I can be a very resilient student in terms of learning biology, and and I can. I can get that knowledge from anywhere, but the verification and the validation of the content knowledge cannot deviate from the norm. And I think a lot of times concepts like resiliencies and competencies and emotional social learning and all that um, is being read as second class competencies, right? Rather than being a true partner to com competencies and content competencies in the field, the content knowledge, um, and seeing it a, a, on, on equal footing, um, they don't always come in, in that view, that stereo view of you've got to have both, you've got to have both in equal measure. Um, one is sort of discounted and the other one is not. And, and depending on who you talk to, you know, if you talk to like a student development um, type of person, they, 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 they tend to emphasize one. And then if you talk to an, sometimes talk to an academic, they seem to emphasize the other. And what we need to do as a field is really to say they are interwoven. You teach the resiliency competencies through your content and vice versa. I think that you're capturing something that I notice a lot with how do we build a bridge between, you know, what I'm learning in the classroom to what I'm actually going to need in the workforce or in the field. And it gets back to what you were talking about before about, you know, kind of giving the same weight to the soft skills or to the communication skills. I mean, I'm my background's in communication, so I always feel like, you know, public speaking and the written word and all of those things kind of get overlooked. They don't carry the same weight in this society, how people value them. And so we know that the soft skills and what we've tied to the resiliency competencies carry a huge weight in the path that a lot of people are going to take after they finish their coursework. And so, you know, my question for you is, one that comes from being a community, a space where we give support and the tools that they need for work, but also life. And I, I just kind of wonder, you know, at Bunker Hill especially, but also from a higher ed perspective in general, like, what does it take to really build that bridge from what happens in the classroom to what happens in the workforce and in your life after you get that certification? Well, you know, I... you. you we, we, we go back to, to somebody as, as traditional and as well anchored as John Dewey, right? When, he, when, we talk about, when we talk about scholarship and, and, and learning anchored into the, in, in actual experience. 
um, this conversation is becoming more and more vibrant. It's it's the building in of experiential learning into into didactic learning. The nurses have gotten it a long time ago. <laughs> they go out to clinicals and they do their thing, right? And the rest of us, like always with nursing, is we're catching up to the nurses. Um, it, it is it is. Uh, it is the ability to to sort of learn the culture um, and not be an immigrant in the in the industry and business world that allows the students to make that crossing. Um, so if we start them early, uh, Northeastern has an internship program that works really well for their students. Bunker Hill has a version of that in Learn and Earn, which is an, a paid internship because our students need to be paid. They have no money to go out and work for free. Um, to, 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 to build them that bridge during their last semester if they choose to do it. Um, I have seen students who come to us at the beginning of their second year of community college in their torn up jeans and backwards caps and, and you know, me having to tell them to pull up their pants. And um, in, in that model, and after a year later of being and, and doing, doing internships at the workplace, coming back in a suit or some, something very slick that I can't afford, um, and looking mm -hmm. professional and acting professional, I mean, it transforms them. And I think that is part of that bridge, right? That is, yeah, part of, um, part of the, the soft skills, as it were, but it's also part of the hard skills because they're learning on the job as well. It's us being mindful as educators in building in those bridges so that they're not jumping over the edge and that they really do have a bridge. Um, so experiential learning is big. I can see that that being... Um, part of um, both K-12 reform and, and higher ed reform, um, and, and being part of um, curricular work, you know, rather than just an experience off to the side. Um, and it, and, but that takes conversation, right? It takes conversation between your career transfer folks who are working in advising or working in, um, in, in job creation uh, with the faculty in the classroom to say, well, what kind of competencies do you want to leap across those two fields? Um, but it's not, it's not, it's not a new concept. It, 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 you know, Dewey had it a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going back to, you know, true human experience in the past and building some of our, our quote unquote innovations off of that. It's been a wonderful conversation and it sounds to me like there's a lot of things that we could continue to explore with you and we really yeah. appreciate that willingness. Well, I, 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 you know, as we're wrapping up, I, I also want to, want to sort of sound out a warning um, which is there are lots of people talking about education all over the place because somehow community college is now hip. Uh, I guess that's a really old-fashioned word. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it is now, you know, the, the, cur the currency of the day. And folks look at community college a lot of times as they look at anything else as a magic bullet. Um, and, 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 and there is no such thing. Um, I have six or seven different categories of students on my campus you know, ranging in age and, and everything else. There is no one strategy for resiliency or for anything else. Yet what I'm hearing out in the field right now are these best practices that people take for, take for, um, for, for a miracle drug, right? So, um, oh, take 15 credits, they'll get them done in two years. Well, no, <laughs> you know, our, our students have a life. Um, they, they, they're, earning, they're earning pay and supporting a family, and therefore they may never happen. But does that mean that it's a failure? So we, in as much as we look at these best practices and developing competencies, we also have to be careful on the other end in how we measure success. Because there's nothing worse than saying to a student who's been trying and practicing all the things that we say to them, and succeeding in a year finishing off three classes. Right, that is a huge amount of huge, huge, huge amount of of, of struggle and a huge amount of um, accomplishment for someone to say, "Oh, well, you didn't take a full load." <laughs> yeah, that's a real danger. It is a real danger um, because we're measuring by a really different stick. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think in all of these conversations we have, uh, it, it pays to to not drink the Kool Aid. Um, I said to a friend, you know, I, I don't drink Kool-Aid, I drink wine. It's the only way to survive in higher ed and community college. <laughs> um, but, it, but it's really true. Um, so, you know, I just, want, I, I just want to be, I want to remind myself to be mindful.